So if I do a very brief introduction, uh, John has been the MP uh, for Dagenham, and now Dagenham and Raynham since 2001. Uh, um, and I think it's worth saying that, you know, fought off the BNP, you know, on two separate occasions when, when they were becoming a rising force. Uh, uh, and I was very interested when you talked about that, uh, uh, you know, some time back. Uh, and again, managed to fight off the Tories, despite the kind of the, the terrible, you know, wave uh, uh, against the Labour Party at the last election. And is still uh, the sitting MP for uh, Dagenham and Raynham. Um, you know, along the way, uh, uh, John has also had, uh, uh, as a, an intellectual and academic, uh, um, uh, produced some works that I think everybody should look at and read. His work on Blue Labour, I thought, was absolutely fascinating and seemed more pertinent still to me uh, after after Brexit. You know, ideas in there that that, uh, that that really should be looked at and thought about. Uh, there's a number of works which you won't list them all, uh, and clearly that John will be talking today um, uh, about um, his latest work, The Dignity of Labour, which again, uh, I, I read from cover to cover, cleared out loads of things from other texts that I've read, uh, and I think it's a fascinating work, but I won't say any more about it because John will speak to it. Uh, and it's worth saying as well that, you know, we're a small academic group, well look at an increasingly large academic group, we've managed to spread our net wider and wider as time has gone on, uh, but you are a coup for us, John, you know, that this is a, you know, John stood as the, uh, for the deputy leader of the Labour Party, uh, back in 2007, you know, and, and, and it's interesting, I'd love to hear you talk about that lately, because I know you sort of decided you didn't want to be a leader, did you? Uh, you know, uh, uh, which is, uh, I think, fascinating and rare in politics. Uh, um, and of course, was, um, uh, now I was going to say head of policy, and I'm not sure that's the right title, but under Ed Miliband, you were the Labour Party policy coordinator, I believe. Uh, so uh, yeah, a man of some political, political weight and great academic credence uh, and delighted to have your job. Uh, and I was going to faffing. Uh, and, and let you speak. Um, well, thanks for that. Uh, it's very nice to see you again. It's 15 years ago, is that? Yeah, I know, we're old. That's truly <laughs> shocking. Hey, we look very well, though. <laughs> but it was a long time ago, and um, I was intrigued when um, about the nature of your group when you uh, very kindly invited me in to share some thoughts with you. I just thought we'd just have a discussion about, you know, things because it is framed around your group I think it's framed around the whole COVID experience and my the book actually that you're referring to this book called The Dignity of Labour came very much out of my own COVID experience whereby um, I suppose it was um, it just gave me time actually most importantly and um, it was a sort of um, it's a sort of victory of the introverted lockdown is, and it sort of worked for me in so many ways, you know, um, in terms of trying to clear ahead of some of the things. But I suppose I'll, what I thought is I'll just say some background to why I wrote the book and some of the things that concern me about it. And they all were bent through the lockdown issues. Really was about, I was just playing around with this notion of the left behind for years, because it, that is my constituency. It's historically, it's... One of the most challenging. It's actually Dagenham is a hundred years old this year. Um, it was born, created in 1921 for the biggest council estate in the world at the time. Um, out of massive slum clearance out of inner East London, where they built 27,000 homes. And the, the, on the 5th of November, it's formally a hundred years old. And I'm actually writing a history of the constituency now, which is a fascinating story because it's the history of capitalism, you know, the rise and decline of Fordism, um, uh, forms of housing policy. And there was this amazing anecdote. Someone wrote a biography of it in 1934. And they said, if Dagenham had been built in America, it would have been a cornerstone of Roosevelt's New Deal. If it had been built by the Soviet Union, it would have been the building blocks of the five-year plan of that period, you know, but because it was built by English people to house the working class, it's sort of ignored as a history. But it was the most amazing housing project coming, and it, and it sort of, when it was built, it sort of it's, it took fourteen years to build, and it parallels literally the decline of liberalism and the rise of socialism actually in the, in the country. And so it sort of has an amazing political history, not least in the post-war period, where it was usually referenced by sociologists like Michael Young, Peter Woodnot, uh, to speak to the virtues of working-class family and kinship patterns. Um, then it single-handedly won the World Cup with Alf Ramsey and, you know, Jimmy Graves and uh, Bobby Moore and all this. And then um, it became 
it brought down a couple of Labour governments, actually, because it arguably had the strongest working class, organised working class in the country, built around the Ford car plant, where we had 43,000 workers, high militant at times, that led, led the Ford negotiations. Um, subsequently, the one-two punch of the right to buy and deindustrialization community disintegrated in a decade or more and then the fire they became the front line in an epic battle against the bmp um so it sort of parallels all these massive national stories so it, it and part of the reason for writing the book was to try and speak to how we understand the nature of human labor because Dagenham is a great portal into some of these debates around the left behind. In fact, it's been used alongside Youngstown, Ohio, as this great signifiers of Brexit and Trump and how you understand the notion of class disenfranchisement. And this dreadful phrase, the left behind, is something that I've always sort of played around with. But what does that mean? And the really interesting thing about that COVID was it represented a lot of the left behind in terms of their dignity of their labor because we were literally having to confront death in ways that were extraordinary and it represented a lot of the work and the virtues of the vocations or the callings by people who tend to be you know off the political radar both left and right so that sort of that was part of the reason for getting into it and basically i suppose i sought to have a look at three sort of intersecting crises, I suppose you could call them. I mean, that sort of disfigure and threaten to literally upend liberal democracy, which all predate the pandemic, but were played out in the context of this sort of pandemic. I suppose the first one, most obviously from a, a Labour MP sort of side, is, is the global decline of the left. Um, it's sort of, it's pale, sort of uninspiring technocratic existence today. It's lack of a moral purpose. And that sort of interests me in terms of, you know, arguably post-war social democracy had a profound moral imperative to civilise capitalism, confront the market um, by building the welfare state. And it's sort of descended into a sort of pale, stale thing. Um, and I suppose the second crisis that are sort of linked to that is the rise of authoritarian populism um, rampaging across the planet upending our politics and what accounts for it and i suppose the third crisis really um linked to the other two in the uk since is this decade-long productivity what they call a puzzle you know they call it a productivity puzzle where i say i think it's a almost a long-term fundamental crisis in the nature of human labor and how it's regulated and put to work, which sits below this sort of productivity crisis. So they were the three um, elements to what I wanted to sort of look at and get into the very unfashionable territory of how labor, human labor is understood, how it's rewarded and how it's represented across our economy and society. Um, not least because the pandemic sort of shone a light on the dignity of work and the vocations performed by many of our fellow citizens who are, you know, as I say, part of this left behind. So basically the argument is um, the left needs to rethink a new politics of work based around questions of human dignity and human labour, which could, you know, confront these three crises, provide new ethical foundations for progressive politics, hopefully re-inspire people make liberal democracies more resilient to the threats of liberal democracy, you know, and offer a route through some of our productivity malaise, our, our puzzle or problem, right? So um, the book is sort of divided into two parts. The first half of it um, considers some of these questions through three competing economic philosophies regarding human labour that have literally defined the shape of post-war British politics. The first um, sort of derived from the classical political economy of Smith, Mill, Muck, Ricardo, um, informed a lot of the post-war corporatism. Um, the second, the sort of neoclassical revolution of the 1870s in economic theory that defined the politics of Thatcherism and much post-Thatcher thinking in and around labor. And thirdly, the thing that 
has interested me more recently is some of the fashionable Marxism that is present on the Corbyn left. And I'm intrigued by its relationship to classical Marxism. I, sh I should put my hands up here, actually, given that the, your PhD students, as I understand it, my PhD was on, um, was on uh, Marxist theory, labour theory, the labour theory of value and how it related to some of the um, evolution or decline in Marxism and how we understand and relate to it. Um, so what I try and do in the book basically is try and rehabilitate a lost social democratic post-war tradition, a form of early stakeholding that sought to bolt the working class into the operation of the economy through the promotion of good work, the extension of collective bargaining and strong trade unions and linked to the evolution of working class power in Dagenham and its decline. And the problem for me is this tradition, um, it's labelled as the Oxford School within industrial relations analysis or econo labour economics. Is, there is no evidence of it existing today. You no know one in the Labour Party knows about this stuff, you know. So at a time of crisis, it's quite a good time to excavate history, to sort of um, rehabilitate certain traditions to see if they can help. Um, so that's sort of what I try and do in the first half of the book. The second half of the book, rather than these three economic theories, looks at three competing political philosophies, in effect, in terms of labour issues and wider questions of justice. Um, the first one concerned with maximising human virtue, usually meant, sorry, human welfare, usually meant to mean utility. And the second with questions of human rights and freedoms and the third the sort of more ancient tradition of promoting human virtue and I sort of link those three into the history of the left um, and I argue it's the sort of latter tradition this sort of virtue tradition that has lost out in the internal battles within the left, within socialism, within Marxism. And consequently, so this is a long journey back to the first question, we've lost our moral purpose. So the argument there is how do you rebuild the ethical character of a party or a political tradition by excavating some of this history, rehabilitating lost histories, paths not travelled, um, and all of that by returning to a question of human labour. I should also add, I, I started off um, in the building industry as a uh, construction worker. A lot of my family, as I mentioned, left Ireland and I'd work on the building industries as, as where that sort of Irish diaspora went. And I spent before I went to college, university, I worked on the buildings in Australia. And I got involved in the Australian Builders Workers Union and how I sort of got involved in politics, really. So that notion of labour is also quite sort of central to my a personal story or history. Um, uh, as an aside, actually, just thinking about the, the in terms of the crisis at the left, I just um, I've just finished George Packer, the American writer, who's written this brilliant biography of Richard Holbrook, the, the diplomat, uh, reflecting. And, and in it, there's this section where Holbrook reflects on the US experience of Vietnam, um, which I found fascinating because I think it sort of approximates to today's problems confronting Labour. And there's this, he does his, he gets this Snoopy cartoon, right? Um, and there's this four parts of this Snoopy cutting where Charlie Brown's walking home after a baseball game, right? So in the first, the first of these four slides, you've got him looking totally dejected. And he simply says, good grief. And in the second um, snap, he says, 184 nil. The third one, he says, um, I just don't understand this. And in the final caption, he says, how can we lose when we're so sincere, right? And Holbrook, Holbrook uses this as an expression for the American experience in Vietnam, but I think it sort of approximates to Labour's problem today in that we keep losing and we cannot understand why, partly because we are so well-meaning and sincere and righteous, you know? And I find this sort of creates this problem in terms of reflection. And it's sort of played out in factional battles within, which is at the expense of an analysis of where we're at, you know, how we lose. So there's little debate about what the party is for, 
which is a bit odd, given that. I don't get where people are politically, but it's a bit odd when we've lost four elections in 11 years and the next victory doesn't look like it's coming around too soon. We've got a mountain to climb a win again, but there's very little debate about what the party is for. Um, and I think a lot of this is what psychologists would call transference, you know. Um, so, you know, who's in and out of the shadow cabinet, how how well Keir Starmer's doing, you know, a few voters in so-called red ball seats, but nothing deeper in terms of the essential character and purpose of the left, its approach to justice. And da, da, da. So I sort of jump into that debate and I simply say that, OK, here's a proposition. Labour should rebuild, or the left should rebuild around questions of human dignity as we emerge out of the pandemic. And specifically in this book, I'll go on about the dignity of labour. I should add, this is a sort of three part project, right? This is the first book is on the dignity of labour. The second one is on the history of Dagenham in terms of the history of community and its relationship to left politics. And then the third one is looking at um, the renewal of human rights, um, given the authoritarian character of surveillance capital and can you use a, a reimagination of human rights to rethink the terms of progressive politics so it's about labor community and rights as the sort of three-part project now returning to this question of human labor you the, the obvious question to say is well what do you mean labor the labor party is not interested in questions of human labor that's what it's all about isn't it and i would say Obviously, historically, yes, in terms of the very creation of a party. Um, but over recent decades, it's lost its way. It's become over-reliant on assumptions that the working class are on the wrong side of history, that they are withering away through to technological change, that the robots are coming. Um, and if you pick up a, any broadsheet newspaper until quite recently, there was this story of mass structural unemployment through technological change da, 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 da. And, and i just thought okay well where's the evidence for this and um because it's a big clutch call this where you write out write off the working class out of the political strip through this assumption that they offer diminishing returns because they are literally disappearing because technology is you know rendering them obsolete and I argue right, that that's partly the problem for Labour because it, it's bought so much into these arguments and people can see it. They can sort of feel the disrespect that goes along with it in lacking or lacking value in what they do. And funnily enough, the self-same people are less prepared to vote for us because of it. So um, now writers like um, Thomas Piketty have recently talked about the rise of what he calls the Brahmin left. The, the most educated citizens and the greatest beneficiaries of the knowledge economy and our meritocracy have uh, captured left-wing parties at the expense of the working class. And he, he, he means Brahmin in a very precise form to mean a socially or culturally superior person. Um, and, and I sort of share that, actually. My fear is that Labour is increasingly drawn from certain parts of society and geographically drawn from urban and university towns. And I mean, if you look at some of the data, 74% of Labour's membership is from the professional middle classes, social classes, ABC1, especially from London and the South East. We increasingly pull a, a growing vote share from the same social classes and declining support amongst the working class. The latest YouGov polling that I saw suggested that Boris Johnson and Tories have a 25% poll lead, 52, 27, I think it was, over Labour amongst working class voters. Now, this is that extraordinary lane change in terms of politics. Um, some Conservative MPs that I know, one in particular, a very thoughtful guy, he says, this is commensurate with 1979 in terms of the reconfiguration of class forces in politics. Um, so this is a pretty big moment, it could be. But, and here's my problem, without any debate on the left, there is a dramatic reset currently underway 
underreported but very significant and there's an emerging new socialist imagination which i initially thought was fantastic around corbyn because it showed energy vitality it was playing around with big ideas it was talking actually it was talking of things like automated luxury communism post-capitalism a world where we invent the future demand full automation a world without work of abundance often financed by universal income and where actually there's no such thing as dignified work and anyone who sort of challenges this is almost immediately defined as right wing in the terms of labor debate uh, and literally what is emerging is a very powerful lobby who self-identify as the post-work left now going back to my biography i mean that's quite challenging for me because I was I came from the work left let's call it the work based left in terms of the industrial political struggles were about mm, rendering work more dignified uh, Paul Mason who, a friend of mine and a brilliant writer uh, he's rec recently said in a piece in the New Statesman I think he said if Labour rejects this vision of a post-work future powered by automation, it will condemn itself to irrelevancy. And I just think, well, that's pretty big call, this, you know, and maybe it should just be analysed and debated. Because if you look, I mean, if, if you look at the data in terms of technology, automation and the end of work, whilst the left, much of the left is embracing new utopias around automation, post-capitalism, luxury communism, a workless future powered by abundance. If you look historically, technological determinism, a core feature of the left, and that includes Corbyn and Blair, I make the point that this is very similar to some of the assumptions around Blair. It's also disfigured the history of the left as well. It's, it's created forms of tyranny, authoritarianism, um, centralization and Lenin's embrace of technological determinism, Taylorism, whatever the technologies that powered the Fordist mode of production actually um, had some dangerous collateral political effects. Um, and more generally, we appeared to be surrounded by talk of the end of work powered through automation, a fourth industrial revolution. Um, but in the book, I go through some of the data and just contest some of the arguments, really. Partly because there's a massive evidence from social sciences across the humanities of the role and purpose of work in our lives as a source of dignity beyond material reward, beyond the utilitarianism of a lot of political debate. There's evidence that suggests the robots, that the robots are coming is highly questionable. The basic point is technology is not destiny. History does not just unfold. These are political questions. And the danger of a lot of this is you depoliticize um, a lot of politics and social sciences. And there's very little consensus about future disruption through technology. Much of it is speculative and contains serious methodological flaws. And instead, we should basically focus on the political choices that confront us and that, that's why i do think i mean biden occurred just as the book came out actually um and he to my mind he's shown a very interesting way of reuniting a coalition across the left across the sort of, between the sort of rust belt and the more liberal east and west coast and at the heart of his plans is a plans to create 18 million new jobs and he's talked about jobs you can raise a family on and ensure free and fair choice to organize and bargain effectively and I think that's really welcome now to me you hear a lot of talk about FDR and the new deal from the 30s but what I found always more interesting was what came later in terms of new deal politics in the 40s where he moved into the territory of economic and social rights, the guarantee housing, medical care, education, social security, writing them into the constitution, beginning with the right to a useful and remunerative job. And that's where I think Labour should go in terms of rethinking human rights, economic and social rights, and new rights to work, 
to be housed, free education, health security, and a duty on politicians to confront the degradation of the planet. So I sort of aware I'm going on a bit long, but the, but the book contains loads of, sort of actual policies around work and the future of work. Uh, new national colleges for jobs like social care to turn these vocations into good work, special covenants for key workers, new statutory single definition of worker decoupled from contractual status, pandemic reconstruction fund forces and all this um, to try and guarantee and a constitutional right to work for everyone, which is different from the right to work in America, which is the preserve of the right. So I suppose sort of wrapping up what I'm saying really, many in Labour hate these arguments. A lot of the Blair crowd see it as too critical of Blair. A lot of the Corbyn crowd rejected out of hand. Um, and I would argue that both wings remain captive to forms of technological and demographic determinism. Basically, where you see victories in every defeat, which fine, it sort of gets you for the day, but I'm not sure it's that helpful in terms of confronting the reasons why you keep losing. Um, but that's politics. I'm, you know, you're not in it to make friends. You just feel, I feel compelled to make an argument because the clock's ticking and I don't think we've ever been in a worse political position than we are now. Um, what I found quite interesting is there is a renewed interest in work just in the last couple of months in Labour and Starmer talked about a lot of work and dignity in his speech. Mayors like Burnham, they're trying to put the question of dignity of Labour centre stage now. I think that's really welcome, not least because the Tory levelling up agenda is a very serious threat to Labour. And I just think we have to confront it rather than hand over these traditional working class communities to the right and bed down in these urban settings in university towns. That could be deadly. Basically, the, the debate goes something like this. Amongst some of the radical left today, in very similar echoes to some of the Blair crowd, they're basically saying the working class is dead. There is a new base for the left amongst urban, educated, networked youth. This is the new global progressive agent. And you should reject class uh, as an organising principle, as a base, and instead embrace a new politics of age and assets, who has them and who doesn't, sort of confronting rentierism in the system. I'm not sure there's an electoral coalition that can win just by doubling down on young, amongst young people. But also I think it's the right thing to do because political parties or traditions are forged through ideas, histories, memories and intellectual currents in terms of philosophies of justice and who you act for. And uh, I always assume that the Labour Party or progressive politics is to a question of economic and social economic advancement of working people and I just you know I'm not prepared to just let that go without even debating it so it's a sort of just a, throwing a rock in a pool really um and see what comes back um and that's sort of what it's all about David really just as that's a bit of a run through of some of the major sort of arguments and themes of it but anyone wants to ask questions give me both barrels pose an argument yeah, let's have a chat about it uh, yeah, great. Uh, that, that, that's the purpose now. Fantastic. Uh, um